Well, good morning and welcome. It's wonderful to see everyone here to uh, meet and re-meet and, and uh, honor and listen to Stuart Udall. It's, my name's Kate Cannon. I'm the current superintendent of the park. And it's my distinct pleasure to welcome Stuart Udall back to Canyonlands National Park, the park, one of the many parks that he was so instrumental in establishing. Grand though that accomplishment is, is just one of the many huge accomplishments that uh, of Stuart Udall's wonderful career, in which he marked America. He he formed America the America we know and love and that will serve generations in the years to come with magnificent national parks that define us and inspire us and refresh us. In addition to that, he was instrumental in many of the other uh, legislations and actions that set aside land for the people of the country as wild and scenic rivers, as wilderness areas. and. Uh, set aside funding to make cities and towns more uh, livable environments through the Land and Water uh, Conservation Fund. Um, we're, personally, I'm very grateful to Mr. Udall for what he has left for me and for my children. And it's uh, wonderful to have him back here. And I hope you'll all join me in welcoming him to Canyonlands. Good morning. Good morning. And, uh, <laughs> one of the names I remember uh, from the old days, I'm going to talk about the old days, uh, is Kent Frost, and I'm glad he's here. Kent, I salute you no. for your support of all the work that we do. There may be others here. I. Uh, I have lost uh, a substantial part of my uh, sight, so I, I can see the view, I can see distances, but I can't uh, uh, see uh, faces unless I'm up close. Uh, I, have, uh, I have come back to Canyonlands with my family. My wife left us a while back. Uh, I have eight grandchildren, six children. All of my children are here except my oldest child who's a congressman. And he has to be in that place where they're doing all the damage to us in Washington. <laughs> uh, but uh, I decided, because I have a very close-knit family, uh, my, all, my children, grandchildren are here, and I said, I'm going to take you back to the Canyonlands, where my career as Secretary of the Interior started. And I'm I'm uh, I'm going to ramble. I don't I can't read from notes. I can't read. I'm just going to talk. That's a privilege of old man, <laughs> being able to just ramble. And uh, uh, I, I'm going to take you back to uh, the beginning of Canyonlands National Park. And I'm going to dig in my memory. I'll probably make some mistakes, and I'll mispronounce names or fail to remember names of people that were important. So forgive me, please. Forgive the old man. And and uh, uh, I uh, I grew up down in northern Arizona. Uh, on the Colorado Plateau, the part of the little Colorado. Uh, this is my home country. Uh, I, I, I used to, uh, uh, I'm a Mormon of sorts. <laughs> and, uh, 
and uh, my father was a church official and we used to drive through this country when I was a boy. So I go back almost 80 years, that's pretty good. And, uh, and so um, the story about the beginning of the drive from the outside, there were a lot of people here, including a man who became a kind of grand uncle of my family, Bates Wilson, who was the park, center, park superintendent of Arches. And he had been pushing, and a lot of local people had been pushing. I don't think Grand County was a board, Bill Hedden, at that point. And I'm sure San Juan County was not with the idea of a national park. But, but uh, uh, where I first got a glimpse of the national park, uh, uh, I, I was Secretary of Interior. The Sierra Club, for uh, one of the few dumb things they proposed, wanted to build a, a dam to protect water from running under Rainbow Bridge. And uh, uh, I brought some congressmen and some press people out to study that problem. We were moving around in helicopters. And uh, <clears throat> we spent a day and a half uh, studying that problem. And um, when we finished, we went back to Page, uh, Arizona, and uh, the, the dam was starting to, to fill. And the, uh, the great figure that you're all familiar with, Floyd Dominey, Bureau of Reclamation, <laughs> he was there. He worked for me. I, I traveled commercial. He had a, a, an airplane and a pilot. <laughs> and, and, and he said, uh, he knew how busy I was. He said, I'm going back to Denver. Would you like a ride? And uh, I said, yes, I, I'd like a ride. And so we got in the plane, he, and he said, I'm going to show you the next big dam on the river at the confluence, below the confluence. Uh, and I said, well, that's fine. And I got in the plane, and we, we were flying along about 10,000 feet. And I, I looked off and saw this country. I saw the needles, the dollhouse, the, uh, all of this. And I didn't say anything to him because he was showing me where he wanted, he wanted to put, and he was a powerful figure, the next dam. And I said, goodness sake, uh, that's a national park. <laughs> that's a national park. <laughs> and I got back to Washington. I didn't say anything to Dominique. Uh, I got back to Washington. I called the park director in and I said, has there ever been a study of the area uh, above the confluence uh, on, on, the, on the Colorado and Green Rivers. <clears throat> and he said, well, I'll check this. And it turned out Harold Ickes, the, the grand old secretary, he had, he had had a little study done. It went nowhere. This is actually, I think, just before World War II uh, in, the, in the 1930s. And, <clears throat> and uh, so, I said, I'm going to go out and take a look at it on the ground. And I put out a press release, and uh, uh, we had then uh, uh, Senator Frank Moss, who was a senator from Utah. This is 19, July 1961. That's when we came. And I, 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 this trip drew... Uh, uh, Life magazine, Look, National Geographic, you name the magazine or the newspaper. I, ha I must have had in the group, oh, 30 or 40 photographers and writers who came to see this area, which I had touted as a potential national park. And uh, this is one of the places, Katie, that we that we brought them to, and their, their mouths were agape uh, at the beauty and the scenery here, because 
I've always felt, in part because I have a, a little fatherly claim to the canyon lands, that in many ways this is more diverse and grand than the Grand Canyon in, in my own state. If, if, you, if you want uh, diversity, the maze, the dollhouse, the needles, all, all the other things, uh, that this has more uh, variety than the Grand Canyon, and I'm from the Grand Canyon State, been saying that, and, and, and this, this had an, an extraordinary impact on these writers and photographers that came, and uh, with them it was almost uh, uh, as though, uh, well of course it's a, grand, it, it's a national park, well, get busy, get it done. We had a little local opposition, though. <laughs> and this was not a popular idea in the region here, because um, uh, along the river at that time, th this was at the end of the uranium boom, and the uranium tailings that are now being moved, because they're a threat to the health of everybody drinking water uh, down below, uh, the, the uranium boom was uh, was ending at that point, and the hero, uh, there was a man, uh, Charlie Steen or something, who who had made a million dollars. That was a lot of money then, and and he had a big house on the hill over at Moab. And so everybody said, well, this is. Uh, uh, why do you want to create a national park? The big argument made against national parks and wilderness at that point in time is that if you designated by law, that was the idea of the Wilderness Act, uh, or created a national park, you had locked out economic activity. The lockout argument was very powerful, and it was used by congressmen and senators who were opposed to the Wilderness Bill. The Wilderness Bill, by the way, was pending, and the first vote that was taken on the Wilderness Bill happened the same month, July 1961. That's the period that I'm talking about. Uh, and they had a vote in the Senate, and it was astounding. It was like a thunderclap. 78 voted for the Wilderness Bill. 12 voted against it, and, and that was overwhelming support because the Wilderness Bill had only uh, had been sponsored five years before, the original bill, uh, and, and so this happened, as I remember, right during the middle of our tour. We must have taken uh, four or five days, and, and uh, the the, uh, Bates Wilson and the Park Service people from Arches, they were in charge of moving us around, and, and this att attracted uh, truly national publicity uh, because of the photography. This is just about the time uh, that you got color photography, <laughs> and that's what this Red Rock country needs to show its magnificence. But uh, we, uh, we came first up uh, to the island in the sky, uh, uh, Bates Wilson, this is before you have these wonderful roads, there were dirt roads and we were making dust and we, had, we were getting all these photographers and, and, and writers dusty, although they were very enthusiastic. So we spent, I think, a day up here. Uh, or a day and a half on the island of the sky, and and, and then uh, we we uh, uh, I rented some helicopters from the mili military. We moved across uh, the area that you're looking out here, and and got a close-up view of the dollhouse and the maze, and and we landed over at uh, <clears throat> we landed over at Chesler Park where the needles are and so on, and we allowed time for 
people to wander around and we had this big press corps. And one of the things that I uh, will always remember because uh, it, showed a, it showed what the distant or what the differences were in the point of view, there were the pro-part people and the anti-part people. And the, uh, the governor of Utah finally joined us. His name was George Dewey Klein. He was an engineer by profession. A good man, I'm sure. Uh, uh, and uh, Kate, we, we, uh, uh, we had the final day after they saw Chester Park and the, the Needles uh, and so on. We had a press conference with the Needles in back of us, <laughs> and and uh, by that time the uh, the press corps had made up their minds <laughs> that this was an incredible opportunity, and the park potential was very great. And <clears throat> and and the governor went with me and uh, the press conference, and uh, we we were standing uh, there and and. Uh, the press, uh, I had made my little speech, and the press, uh, the governor hadn't spoken, and didn't want to speak, and the press said, Governor, uh, uh, we're all overwhelmingly impressed at this fantastic area, uh, and why are you opposed to it being a national park? And he looked and he waved at the needles, these wonderful stone pars, and he said, you don't realize this is a mining state. We might need this as building stone. That's what he said. And that represented the attitude of the opponents of the park. In fact, the, the, the governor and the old uh, Senator Bennett, Wallace Bennett, had proposed that Dead Horse Point State Park they were willing that that be made into a national park and taken off their hands. But uh, they said they can stand on the point and look off and, and, and in effect, see the national park in a distance. Of course, that's, by the way, what too many people do down at the Grand Canyon. No, they come, they, 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 they come from Las Vegas and plane they get off and and, and they go and look and take a picture, and they're gone. You don't take a picture of the Canyonlands and see the Canyonlands. Uh, that isn't possible. But uh, that's where we were. But w we were fortunate. We had uh, this young senator, Frank Moss, who played a tremendous role in what happened. We had two congressmen. Dave, David King was the son of the former senator. And I forget, I think the other one was named Peterson. So we had the congressional delegation, or most of it, except Senator Bennett. And, and uh, we, thought, we thought we were off to the races. But uh, it took us three years to get the legislation through uh, Congress. Uh, I, ha I had the National Park Service put a study team send a study team in here to uh, uh, develop boundaries for a proposed national park. And I told them to be generous. <laughs> Don't exclude the, the best parts of the country. They came back with a plan for a million acre park. Uh, Senator Moss, who had, as all members of Congress do, political problems, he slowly shrank it to the president. Uh, size. It still could be enlarged, and if I were young enough, uh, I would invite the present Senator Bennett to come right here and sit on the edge and have a talk with me about <laughs> possible enlargements uh, of the park. Now, a lot of this is rugged country. Rugged country protects itself. That was one of the arguments that and I wilderness people may well. Why do we need a wilderness bill? The land, the rugged land, uh, the the high country protects itself, and so on. But uh, th th this is where we started, and it slowly shrank. The main opponents of the 
of the uh, legislation at that time, uh, well, the Grand County Board of Supervisors, cattlemen, cattlemen had legitimate interests. We respected that, as I'll tell you in a minute. Uh, <clears throat> and so uh, the, the, uh, the, the first big hearing they had in Moab, uh, Senator Moss and the congressman had a hearing there to uh, hear pros and cons of people. And Bates Wilson, this uh, superintendent who was one of the sweetest men I, I ever met, his, my children all remember him and love him, uh, and uh, Bates made the pr presentation for the Park Service and he had maps and so on. And the first <clears throat> opponent who got up and took the floor uh, <clears throat> said, because Bates was very popular, the people that disagreed with him loved him. And he said, oh, he said, Bates has had his say and he's presented his case. He said, uh, we, we all know Bates Wilson. If he had his way, he'd put most of southern Utah in a national park. Bates is sitting in the crowd and he says, that's about right. <laughs> and, and so, that's where the park idea began. We had to make economic uh, arguments, and the uh, Grand County people, uh, Bill Hedden, uh, they got on us later. We had the University of Utah do an economic study of what the economic benefits would be uh, if you establish a national park. Visitation, of course, is what we're talking about. And the other side saying, well, there are vines there. They're, they're, there's uranium, blah, blah, there's other, other things, there are other values, not just tourism. And, and so the, the, uh, the uh, argument, uh, we had the University of Utah do an economic study and they, they predicted huge benefits. Actually, they exceeded themselves. And we, we, we later were, uh, were accused <laughs> for about 20 years of, or, uh, by Grand County people, you promised all this, where is it? And so on. But it, it took time, as you can see, for that to happen. We also had a film made. The Park Service authorized a film. And we had an American premiere in Salt Lake City. And I developed the argument, and I thought it was logical because I believe then and I believe now that the most scenic land area in the world is the Colorado Plateau. Most scenic in the world. That's a big statement. I, I, I went, I was dumb enough to stay, or smart enough to stay for eight years as Secretary of Interior, and I went to most of the continents of the world. I didn't get to, India or the Himalayas uh, or, or Australia uh, and other places. But I have said in, in many, to many audiences around the world that this is the most scenic, for scenic beauty and splendor. Uh, I'm including the Grand Canyon, the whole thing, the Colorado Plateau. And I used to say, one of my arguments to Utah pe people is, Utah, California is four times or five times as big, and 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 and, and they have uh, uh, four national parks. Why shouldn't, shouldn't Utah have five? Because you have the most scenic land. Well, that worked with some people, and ultimately, uh, in 1964, uh, the same summer, uh, the Wilderness Bill passed. Uh, the Canyonlands Park Bill passed, and uh, I don't think there were very many, uh, very many no votes at, at that point, because we had made a few compromises. We shrank the boundaries. There was a cattle company uh, uh, that had the right to graze cattle uh, uh, down in the Low Country. Of course, we you know there's a lot of heat and not much rain down there. And there, that meant there wasn't much grass, and uh, and we we made an exception, Katie, in the bill uh, to get it passed, uh, and the cattle company agreed because it wasn't a prime grazing land area, 
and <coughs> we gave them 10 years. We, we had uh, the National Park and there was grazing allowed for 10 years, and, and Congress went along with that, and, and that became that became part of the bill. Uh, and of course, you don't get the full development of national parks until you have uh, not a lot of roads, but roads into the key places like the road you up to the island in the sky that you're on today. And that, that, that takes time. And that's the reason the Grand County people say, you said oh, there'll be all these tourists, where are they? I say, well, <laughs> it'll take a little time. But uh, <clears throat> there, were, there were people uh, who spoke up. Kent Frost is one of them. He's here today. Uh, uh, there were others uh, led by Bates Wilson who were beating the drums all along and so on. And that's the story of the beginning. That's why I came, what I came here to say to present to you today of my memories of how the project uh, uh, got started. And uh, I still uh, think, as I have said earlier, uh, I think this is one of the most magnificent places in the United States. You can talk about the Grand Canyon, you can talk about Yellowstone, you can talk about Yosemite and so on. I'm biased. I'm not sure they compare with the canyon. How about that? Thank you. Thank you. Could you stay up here for a minute? Yeah. Um, I think that there may be some questions that people in the audience would like to, to ask Secretary Udall. And we also have a, we have a, a, a poster that we framed it, to remind you of this place when you go home, in case you need any reminding. So let me give that to you now. Want to unwrap it? Yeah. You want me to no, use it. Yeah. <laughs> I suppose you have a lot of them. Yeah, I guess we'll have a few questions. I assume most of you are converts and a friendly audience, but I'll, I'll even take a, a harsh question if there are any. Sir? My father Bates would have uh, enjoyed meeting you again. A little louder. <laughs> My father Bates cherished you very much. Your, your base is all yeah. my goodness or something. He, he spoke of you many, many times. And if I could <coughs> tell the audience the story. Come on up here. This is Bates Wilson's yeah. son. I'm Tuck Wilson, Bates' uh, son. My father told a little slightly different story of the first trip. <laughs> and you have to my father always made new stories from old ones. So when Stewart was, had been in Washington for about a year, he, he needed a vacation. I don't know why anyone in Washington would need a vacation. But he called up someone in the Park Service office and says, I need a vacation. And they said, well, there's a ranger, loose term, out in Utah wants to make the whole state, the southern part, a national park. <laughs> and Stu said, that would be great. So he comes out, he sends an advance team, and the advance team was two helicopters. And this is the interesting part of the story. The Army sent two helicopters. The old airport was in Spanish Valley in Moab. So the helicopters leave, and Dad takes them on a sort of a survey trip, which was in the maze, to the river bottom, to the Needles, island in the sky, and back. As we're flying back to Moab in the Army helicopters that he told us he rented, <laughs> my family could have sued you. <laughs> 
Dad is sitting in the back of one of the helicopters, the second helicopter, and they put earphones on and everything, and he hears on the, on the earphones one pilot say to the other pilot, Sir, the gas tank shows low. And the pilot says, what about the reserve tank? He says, it's empty. <laughs> so he says, well, ask Ranger Wilson where we are. <laughs> and they're behind the rocks. So they ask my father, can we make it to the airport? Which means you've got to go up over the rim and down. Dad says, no. So they set it down, the empty one, the full one, loaded all the crew. They went to the Spanish airport and got fuel and came back. So someone in the army, sounds a little bit like maybe something over in the Middle East, didn't serve as the helicopter. So now back to Stu. So he comes out here for his vacation and he never goes back. <laughs> Thank you for coming. All right. Thanks for that.